We are, of course, during this festival of God that is called the Days of Unleavened Bread. God instructed ancient Israel uh, back in Exodus chapter 12 that in Exodus 12:15 that seven days they were to eat unleavened bread. And he told them that they were to have put away the leavening out of their homes. In uh, verse 17 of Exodus 12, he told them they were to observe the days of unleavened bread, uh, that it was to be observed in their generations by an ordinance forever. So it was something that was to continue. And uh, they were told in verse 18 that they were to begin at the end of the 14th day eating unleavened bread, and they were to eat it up through the end of the 21st day uh, in the evening. And verse 15, in other words, the evening, the sunset that begins the the next day, uh, seven days, verse 19, uh, no leaven is to be found in your homes. So in verse 20 of Exodus 12, Israel was told, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitation shall you eat unleavened bread. So we find several things that are brought out here. We find an emphasis on three aspects. We find, an as- we find an emphasis on the fact that there was to be a cleansing away, a cleaning out, a removal of leavening. We find that there was to be an absence of taking in leavening during that period of time. Prior to the days of unleavened bread, Israel was to have removed the leavening. During the days of unleavened bread, they were not to take in or consume new leavening. But it was not simply the days of no bread at all. It was the days of unleavened bread. So they were to replace what they got rid of. They were to replace it with something else. They were to replace it with bread that was unleavened. This was a festival that was to last for seven days. Seven is God's number of completion. God uses that number in a significant way through the Scriptures. So we find an emphasis here on a festival that God says is to be kept forever. And forever, of course, is still going on. Now, in the New Testament... In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul addressed this subject and that not only were these festivals relevant for the ancient Israelites, they are relevant for the Church of God today. And uh, as we find ourselves here in these days of unleavened bread, I think it is very important that we focus in on the lessons that God would have us learn from this festival season. And there are many lessons in many aspects, and we can't go into every aspect of it today. But I want to focus in, to focus our attention on the spiritual aspect of what it is we are to learn. From putting out the leavening, from not taking in any new leavening, and for replacing it with unleavened bread. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul addressed the subject because clearly when you read 1 Corinthians in context uh, and tie it in with the book of Acts and just with the internal material in the book, uh, it is apparent that Paul wrote uh, the book of 1 Corinthians immediately after the Passover service uh, or immediately after he had gotten word of a Passover service in Corinth, which would have probably been Uh, perhaps a couple of days after uh, the uh, uh, event had taken place, and uh, uh, wrote it actually during the days of unleavened bread. And as Paul addressed the subject in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 1, he said, It is reported commonly that there is fornication, there's immorality among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So, immorality in general is bad, but what was going on there was an absolute scandal. Here was a man who was living in a, in, in a really in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother, living in sin, living in fornication. 
Now, the response of the Corinthian church was a completely distorted and misguided response. Paul told them in verse 2, You are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. The Corinthians had a distorted concept of love. You know, many people have the concept that the God of the Old Testament was the God of law, and the God of the New Testament is the God of love. You know, and everything is love and all nicey-nice in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament is this, this old harsh law. Well, there's nothing that could be further from the truth. Because in reality, the, the one who was the God of the Old Testament, the very one who spoke the words of the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai, was none other than Jesus Christ, the one who became Jesus Christ, and magnified the law in its spirit and intent. Because law and love, far from being opposites, go together. You can't have love without law. Because we're told this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. For his commandments are not grievous. We're told that in terms of of the very nature of God, if you were to sum up the very nature and character of God in one word, the word is love. God is love. The Apostle John tells us that in 1 John. When Jesus was asked, what is the first and great commandment of the law? He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. So Jesus explained that the commandments of God explain to us how to love. See, love is not just sort of the sweet sentiment and emotion that people have in their heart. The first four commandments tell you how to love God. The last six tell you how to love your neighbor. Love is the, is the basis of how we're to relate. How we're to relate to God and how we're to relate to neighbor. The Ten Commandments amplify that and explain to us how to show love toward God. How to show love toward our neighbor. And other places in the scripture further amplify and magnify... And particularly in the New Testament, we have magnified the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law, which means the intent behind the very law of God. What it is that God is getting at. What God wants. So, the idea that the God of the Old Testament was the God of law and the God of the New Testament is the God of love is is a very distorted concept. And, of course, many of the world's religions... uh, uh, sort of hold on to that or, or, or advocate that. But the Corinthians had a distorted concept of, of love. They confused love with toleration of sin. And so they were puffed up. They were actually sort of proud of themselves as to how tolerant they were. And Paul said, you're not doing that man a favor by allowing open, flagrant sin in the congregation and just sort of going along as though it's no big deal. You should have mourned. You should have really been bothered. That should have been upsetting to you. That should have been a grievous thing to see such a horrible thing going on. This this individual should have been put out, Paul says. In verse 3, he said, Now, I truly as absent in body but present in spirit, I've judged already as though I were present concerning him that has done this deed. Paul says, I don't even have to be there. All I need to know is what's going on, and I can tell you exactly what needs to be done. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So, in other words, the individual, if you're going to live like the devil, then just, there's the devil's world, go to it. And, uh, in a sense, removed outside the the scope of God's protection. Uh, there is a certain protection and, and uh, uh, that, God, uh, that God gives. And so, in effect, this individual was turned over that he might learn a lesson. Paul's desire was not to see the person destroyed, but that ultimately, regardless of what trial and tribulation of what may happen to grind this man down, that he would wake up and repent. And ultimately, be in the kingdom of God. Real love is a desire to see repentance 
on the part of a sinner. And this individual was a flagrant sinner. So Paul then goes on to tell them in verse 6, Your glorying is not good. Don't you know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? It spreads this attitude or this, this sin in your midst will spread and it will have a contaminating influence as it sort of spreads through the congregation that sin is no big deal. And of course, ultimately, brethren, sin is a very big deal because it is sin that cost the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He had to die to pay for your sins and for mine. So sin is a very big deal. He said, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. That's interesting. In my Bible, there's a little number three out by the words, the feast. You may have a similar marginal note in yours. There's a little number three out by the words, the feast. And in the margin, it reads, or holy day. Therefore, let us keep the holy day. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now the Apostle Paul begins to expound the spiritual significance of these festivals, and particularly this festival, the Days of Unleavened Bread. He told them that they were to become, as a church, as a congregation, a new lump, an unleavened lump. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. You know, we're told in Romans 5 that God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That, of course, is the message of the Passover. That Jesus Christ came as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. That Jesus Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. That God commends His love toward us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. But you know, Romans 5 goes right on into Romans 6. And Romans 6, chapter 1, uh, 6th chapter and verse 1 tells us the connection that the days of unleavened bread have with the Passover. In Romans 6, 1. What Shall we say then, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, the point is that while God commends His mercy, His grace, His love toward us, and Christ died for us, does that simply mean, oh, well, you know, God's, God's extending His grace, so you don't have to, you, you, you can just... You know, we can just continue in sin and let grace abound. You don't have to keep the law because Christ died. Well, that's ridiculous. Christ died to pay the penalty for sin. But our response to that has to be one of coming out of sin. When God, when God told ancient Israel to slaughter the lamb in, 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 Israel, in Egypt... On the first Passover, when he told them to slaughter the lamb and put the blood of the lamb on their doorpost, that the death angel would pass through the land and pass over all the homes that were under the blood of the lamb and would smite the firstborn of Egypt dead. Why did God pass over the Israelites? Well, I know they had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. But why did he spare them? Why did he make possible a way for them to be spared? Did he make that possible so they could just stay in Egypt and remain a part of Egypt? Did he spare them so they could stay in Egypt? No. God performed a miracle and spared them for the purpose of of enabling them to come out of Egypt and leave Egypt behind. God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, not so we can continue in sin. No. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue any longer therein? We are to come out of sin. 
we're to put sin out of our lives. Paul says, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. Now, how were the Corinthians unleavened? I don't know of but two ways to use that expression. Either to use it in a physical, literal sense, or to use it in a spiritual, in a metaphorical sense. Can you think of any other way to use it? Were they spiritually unleavened? Is that a description of their spiritual condition? No. Because in verse 2 it says you're puffed up. Spiritually, they were puffed up. Their condition wasn't unleavened. They were leavened. They needed to get rid of the leaven. The only way the Corinthians were unleavened was physically. And Paul said, look, it's not enough simply to be physically unleavened. The reason God gives us the days of unleavened bread is not simply for the purpose of getting our house clean once a year. You know, that's not the only purpose of the days of unleavened bread, is just so we can clean out breadcrumbs. There is a spiritual lesson, and Paul amplifies it right here. He says, you need to purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump spiritually, just like you're unleavened physically. For Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. We go on from the Passover on the 14th day of the first month to keep the feast on the 15th day of the first month, as we're told in Leviticus 23. Therefore, let us keep the feast. You see, the next thing we do after the Passover is to keep the feast. And we don't keep it with old leaven. You don't get up and eat biscuits or toast or pancakes for breakfast that morning, at least you better not. Not supposed to, you know, chomp down on a donut or whatever. Let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. No more than you'd think of sitting down and, and uh, uh, you, you know, eating biscuits for breakfast to start off the days of unleavened bread. No more than you would think of that, neither should you consider harboring the old spiritual leaven, the leaven of malice and wickedness. No, that needs to be purged out and it needs to be replaced with what? The unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. See, that's what we need to be taking in. This, that's why these days are not simply the, the days of no bread at all. They're the days of unleavened bread. Because you see, just as we learn a lesson by getting rid of something, we also learn a lesson by replacing it with something else. It's not enough just to get sin out of your life. You've got to replace. You know, righteousness is more than just the absence of wickedness. It is the presence of what is good and right. It's not enough just to quit doing what you shouldn't do. You also need to start doing what you ought to do. You see, the two go hand in hand together. Paul explains it, um, well, you just uh, hold your place here. We might just look back in, in Ephesians. Let me give an example of that. An example is found in, in Ephesians 4.28. <clears throat> Ephesians 4.28, it says, Let him that stole steal no more. See, that's unleavening. That's getting rid of the leaven. Getting rid of something that you shouldn't do. Steal no more. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needs. Now, you see, that's replacing it with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. If you just quit stealing, that's good. You know, you ought to quit stealing. But that's not enough. God says, yes, quit stealing, but replace that with something positive. You know, work, be productive, so that you can be a giving, sharing, helping person. It's not enough just to quit taking you need to replace it by start producing and giving. 
So there's a negative. There are things we stop, but there are also things we start. Coming on down, verse 29, he says uh, of Ephesians 4, he said, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So, you know, we ought to let corrupt communication quit proceeding out of our mouth. All sorts of gossip and rumor and accusation and, and filthy talk and dirty jokes and, and things that, that are corrupt, that are rotten, dirty speech. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. That's, that's important. We stop saying certain things. But does that mean you just sort of, you, you could do that. You could just put tape over your mouth and not say anything at all. Would that be enough? God be satisfied with that. You just go through life and never say anything to anybody. Boy, you know, no corrupt communication proceeds out of his mouth. He doesn't say a word. That's not enough. It's not enough just to unleaven. You've got to replace it. But that which is good to the use of edifying, of building up, of helping, of encouraging that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So we, we try to get rid of, of, the, of the wrong kind of speech, the things that, that are ugly, that are put-downs, that are, that are negative, that are sarcastic and ugly and harsh and, and calling people ugly names and saying uh, horrible things about people and dirty jokes and filthy speech and, and all sorts of swearing and cursing and all these sorts of things. We, we're trying to get rid of the corrupt communication. But it's not enough just to get rid of that. You know, God gave us a mouth to do something positive. Now, He doesn't want us to misuse it and say the wrong thing. That's right. We need to stop saying the wrong thing. That's good. But that's not enough. We've got to start saying the right thing. Things that are helpful, that are uplifting, that are, that are upbuilding, that are encouraging. He says that ministers grace unto the hearers. In other words... Words that have a certain positive, uh, a gracious, kindly quality. Where someone is the better off. They feel better after talking to us, not worse. You see, there is a positive, uh, on down in verse 31 of... Ephesians 4, it says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Oh, so we're, we're to get rid of all those things. The bitterness, the wrath, you know, having a bitter, resentful attitude toward, toward someone. A lot of people just go through life and they're just filled with, with bitterness and resentment. About all the unfairness that's happened. Well, we live in the devil's world, and so we need to expect that there are going to be a lot of unfair things that happen. That's the devil's world. That's why we need the kingdom of God. Because there isn't a lot of fairness and equity in this world. Sometimes there are things that happen that are, that are all right. But, you know, some people just go through life very embittered because of things that have happened. Things that have happened that weren't fair. Life is filled with things that aren't really fair. We have to put away the bitterness, the wrath. I'm going to get even. I'm going to, I'm going to get you. Plotting retaliation and revenge. The anger. The clamor. Just getting ready to start a fight or stir up a riot. The evil speaking. Spreading gossip and rumor and accusation. Those things need to be put away from us with all malice. You remember we were told to get rid of the leaven of malice and wickedness? Malice means evil intent. It has to do with your, with your intent. You're going to get somebody. You're going to fix them. You're going to get them. That becomes the underlying motive of all kinds of actions. So we need to unleaven our lives, getting rid of the bitterness, the wrath, the anger, the clamor, the evil speaking, uh, the malice, the attitude that, that underlies these things. That has to be put away. But it's not enough just to put that away. 
Verse 32, you've got to replace it with something. Be you kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. You know, continuing right on in chapter 5, verse 1, Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and has given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You know, Mr. Zenon talked about the old wine or the new wine and old wineskins and the new cloth on an old garment, and he talked about how that you can't fit the new in with the old. You see, we can't hold on to the old bitterness, anger, and clamor and sort of fit in uh, godly love along with that. They're, they're incompatible. We can't fit the new way of life, a way of obedience to God, a way of having God's law written in our hearts and in our minds, we can't fit that in with the old worldly ways and worldly attitudes. They're they're incompatible. They won't fit together. We can't fit in the truth of God uh, with our old religion, our old ways. It doesn't fit. So what we find, just even from this little section here of Ephesians 4, is the fact that it is not merely enough to get rid of the negative. We've got to replace it with the positive. We have to get sin out of our lives by putting in to its place positive Obedience. Replacing the leaven of malice and wickedness with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, as we look back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul says, in, as we read in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, verse five, uh, chapter 5, not chapter 6, 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 8, He says we're to keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He said, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, then you must needs go out of the world. He said, when I told you you shouldn't be associating and hanging around with people like that, I'm not talking about just people in the world. You'd have to go off and sit in a cave somewhere if you were uh, not going to associate with anybody that was a a fornicator or an idolater or an extortioner or covetous. You wouldn't be able to go to work. You wouldn't be able to walk down the street. Uh, You you know, you just wouldn't be able to go anywhere because the world is filled with people like that. And you run into them here, there, and yonder. So he says, that's not what I'm talking about. You know, you, you just have to go off and live in a cave somewhere on a desert island, uh... That's not what I mean. But verse 11, Now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. So he said you shouldn't just continue on normal Christian fellowship with someone who is flagrantly living in sin as though it's no big deal. You should not be, quote, accepting of his lifestyle. You know, if he's going to call himself a Christian and he's going to be living in sin, God does not accept, quote, our lifestyle. We have to accept God's lifestyle. That's known as repentance. Now, God loves us while we are yet sinners. You know, there's a difference between unconditional love and unconditional acceptance. God God loves, God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us no matter what we have done. But God does not accept us in our sins. He saves us from our sins. And there's a vast difference. Many of the world's concepts sort of turn grace into license. 
you know, God's grace gets mistaken as a license to sin. And that's not what God's grace is. It's not a license to sin. It is a gift that makes possible our exodus from sin. So he says that we're not to just continue on in a uh, in, in Christian fellowship with someone who is living a totally unrepentant lifestyle. Verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them that are without? But do not you judge them that are within? So he says, look, the responsibility of the church is not to uh, we're not judging the world right now, but there is judgment to be exercised within the church. Them that are without, God judges. God's going to deal with them. God will deal with the world in his own time. But we are to exercise responsibility within the congregation. Them that are without, God judges. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So... Here we find conduct that would involve immorality, covetousness, idolatry, railer, which just means a violent, angry person that's, that's uh, uh, yelling and accusing and, and uh, just a, a very uh, uh, angry, abusive type of an individual, a railer, or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. The Apostle Paul labels those things as pertaining to wickedness. You see, we're to get rid of the leaven of malice and wickedness. Wickedness has to do with conduct, malice has to do with attitude, and they both have to do with. What is inappropriate? So, if we're going to unleaven our lives, then we have to examine both our conduct and our attitude. And to make some changes. And to replace conduct that is reflective, to, re- to, to replace that which is, reflects wrong conduct, sinful conduct, as well as sinful attitudes... To replace that with sincerity and truth. Now, sincerity has to do with an attitude. And truth has to do with with something that is, is real. See, it's not enough just to serve God with sincerity. There are a lot of people that are sincere. They're sincerely wrong. And, and it's not enough just to be sincere. Uh, you know, there's sincere Buddhists and sincere Hindus and sincere Muslims. And, uh, you know, some of these people are so sincere, they'll die for their religion. You've got to say they're sincere. Uh, you know, Japanese kamikaze pilots were sincere during World War II. I mean, they were uh, <laughs> ready to go on a suicide mission. Uh, you, 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 I can't fault their sincerity. Somebody's ready to give his life for something. He's undoubtedly sincere. But he may be very misguided, totally wrong in what he's sincere about. So it's not enough just to be sincere. Now, God requires that we be sincere. But he requires more than we, that we be sincere. You know, there are many people, and we've all known people who are sincere, but he tells us we're to take in the unleavened bread of sincerity, which has to do with our heart, with our attitude. We're also to take in the unleavened bread of truth. The unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, what is truth? Well, Jesus said in John seventeen seventeen, Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. God's word reflects His truth. Jesus Christ said that He came to bear witness of the truth. We're told in Psalm 119 that God's Word is true from the beginning. It's true from the beginning. 
You know, starting with Genesis 1-1 and running all the way to the back of the book. God's Word is true. So, the truth has to do with God's way of life, has to do with God's law, which He is in the process under the new covenant of writing in our hearts and in our minds. You know, the new covenant doesn't do away with the law. It doesn't substitute some other law. It is the difference between the law of God written with the finger of God on tables of stone and the law of God written with the Spirit of God in our hearts and in our minds. Between something that is merely an external code and something that is an internalized way of living. A way of living and thinking and being. Because we're in the process of being transformed from the inside out to reflect the very nature and character of God. A spiritual transformation that God is in the process of working in us. Now, we're going to see that a little later in how it ties in with unleavened bread. Because ultimately, we are to feed on Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. He perfectly summed up the way that we're to live and think and be. Because we're to have Jesus Christ living in us. Now, there are all sorts of substitutes. All sorts of substitutes. Let's go back to the book of Matthew, chapter 16. Let's look at some of what Jesus warned his disciples about. You know, one thing you learn as you look at go looking for unleavened bread, you can't always tell just from the looks. You can't always tell just from the looks. There's bread that looks flat. You know, soda crackers look pretty flat. But they're leavened. That's why they're called soda crackers. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of crackers and things in the store. You, you go in, you know, and you look at these crackers. I remember one of the things that always surprised me the most uh, years ago uh, was grape nut cereal. Now, those things look like little BBs or something. I mean, they're, uh, you, you know, about as hard and, and, and tiny as you can find. And uh, never dawned on me that those things would be leavened. And I looked on the box one time, and there it said, Yeast. I did a little checking uh, to find out, well, what in the world? How did, what do you mean leavened? How is this thing leavened? And I found out that it's actually baked as a loaf, that they, that they, they, they mix it up as a batter, and it's baked in, a, in an oven in, in, a, in, a, in a special slow-bake process uh, to where it's dried out all the way through. And it's, just, it's, it's actually uh, a bread. It rises. It, it's, it's baked uh, very slow until it's hard and, and crispy all throughout, uh, hard all the way throughout, sort of like uh, you know, taking, taking a bread and cutting it up and making croutons out of it. Uh, you know, just because it's hard doesn't mean, mean it's unleavened. Just all, all hard means is that the moisture's gone out. Well, moisture doesn't have anything to do with leavening one way or the other. Uh, all it means when something's hard is is that the moisture's gone. So anyway, they they, they bake this up and and make uh, uh, a very uh, a very dry uh, loaf out of it, and they run it through a roller, and it's crumbled up. They put it in a box. And uh, just because something looks flat, uh, it's un- it doesn't mean it's, it's leavened. Or it doesn't mean it's unleavened. And in the same way, just because something has the outward appearance of religion, doesn't mean that it's the real thing. It doesn't mean that it's sincerity and truth. In Matthew chapter 16, in... Chapter 15, we uh, read the story of verse 32, where Jesus called the the disciples and he said, I have compassion on the multitude. They've continued now with me three days and they don't have anything to eat. You know, people had brought along something, but uh, they'd been there with him three days and they'd eaten what they had and stayed longer than they uh, had anticipated. And he said, I'm not going to send them away fasting. Uh, You know, they're they're hungry. Uh, They've already eaten up the food they brought and I've... uh, I kept them here, and, and I've continued to talk and do these things, and they've stayed, and now I'm ready to leave. 
Uh, and the disciples said, well, we're never going to find enough bread to feed them. You know, I, I'm sure you don't want to send them away hungry, but uh, uh, there's no place out here you're going to get food to buy them, uh, to feed them. And Jesus said, well, look around and see how many loaves you can find. They said, well, we found uh, seven loaves and a few little fishes. He commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, took the seven loaves and the fishes, gave thanks, broke them, gave them to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude, and they did all eat and were filled. And they took up all the broken food that was left, seven baskets full. Now, just as an aside, I want to point out that when uh, Jesus left someplace, uh, it didn't uh, look like they had held a rock fest there. You know, the place wasn't covered with litter and trash. He not only fed them, but he cleaned up the mess afterwards. Uh, that's uh, maybe a minor point, but I think it is something that certainly ought to be reflective of us as the people of God. You know, sometimes you go in behind some group somewhere and they've been, and, and it's just this giant cleanup uh, that they've got to come in. There's just trash and junk everywhere. That should certainly never reflect us, uh, though occasionally it has. You know, sometimes I've gone into a, at a holy day or something, gone into a bathroom. We were the only ones there. there wadded up paper towels all over the place and and, and, and water splashed and, and uh, just a mess that uh, not very pleasant to have to come in behind and, and wash your hands. And, you know, if we all clean up after ourselves, uh, then uh, nobody has a real big job. Uh, Christ took care of things like that, even little things. You know, the law of God involves little things as well as big things. And uh, so anyway, they ate, they were filled, took up the broken food, uh, the leftovers and, se- and, and uh, seven baskets full. And they that did eat were 4,000 men besides the women and children. And he sent them away, took ship, and came to the coast of Magdala. Now, chapter 16, verse 1, The Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came, and tempting him, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he said, When it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather. The sky is red. Weather patterns uh, tend to move in a, in a particular way, and what they uh, uh, weather patterns moved across from from uh, uh, in in this area from the uh, there on the Mediterranean coast uh, tended to move across in a certain way. And so, if it was evening and they could uh, look out as the sun set and see that it was the sky was red, they said, "Well, you know, we're going to have fair weather. Not there's not a front uh, coming in the morning." Uh, They look out and they say, it'll be foul weather today. The sky is red and lowering. You know, they can see the sun, uh, see where the sun's rising, and they can see uh, all these clouds and everything, and they know a front is moving in. He said, you can look at the sky and you can tell, you know, if if a weather front is moving in, you can tell by the uh, diffusion of light, by the color of of the sunset, and by the clouds you see, uh, and the direction in which you see them, you can you can discern certain things as to whether it's going to be a good day for planting or whether you're going to get out in the field uh, just about time to uh, for for weather problems to break out. You know, most farmers can do that. Uh, they spend time uh, outside and and they look out at the sky in the morning. And they decide as to whether they want to cut and bale hay that day uh, or whether they think, you know, about the time I get things going good, uh, it looks like it's going to rain. I don't think this is going to be a good day. So he said, you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. So there are signs of the times that we ought to be able to look at and to discern. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. There will no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And that is, of course, the fact that Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. And God brought him forth. Jesus Christ was, of course, to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And exactly as he said, to come forth. This was a special sign to the religious leaders because, you see, they had actually... uh, Uh, In a very special way, it was a sign to them because they uh, had uh, put guards and posted guards there at uh, at the tomb, or at least had Pilate to do so, uh, so that uh, they could make sure that the body wasn't stolen. So they had the witness of their own guards, whom they later bribed to tell a lie. 
You know, if you bribe somebody to tell a lie, there are two people that know it's a lie. <laughs> the guy who took the bribe and the guy who gave the bribe. Bribe. Those two know it's a lie. Everybody else may believe it. So it was a very special sign to them. They had, they had their own witnesses uh, of their own choosing right there to see that exactly three days and three nights later, Jesus Christ came forth. So he left them and departed in verse 4. And in verse 5, the disciples were come to the other side. They had forgotten to take... They'd overlooked that. And they were getting hungry. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves and said, It's because we've taken no bread. He must not want us to buy bread from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Well, when Jesus perceived, he realized what they were doing. They totally missed the point. He said, oh, you have little faith. Why do you reason among yourselves because you have bought no bread? You think I'm worried about where we're going to get bread to eat? Don't you remember the 5,000 or the five loaves that I fed the 5,000 with and how many baskets you took up? Don't you remember the seven loaves and the the 4,000 and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you don't understand that I speak not to you concerning bread, that you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Then they understood how he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh, Christ told them to beware of leaven. What leaven? You know, some leaven comes obvious as malice and wickedness. You see people out uh, uh, robbing banks and, and uh, committing murder. Uh, that, that's pretty obvious, you know. That's, that's wicked. You see uh, people involved in all sorts of, of uh, gross immorality. Well, that's wicked. You see, we, we can look out and, yes, there are very obvious malice and wickedness that, that is on the horizon that we can see in our society. Sort of like walking into a store, and you can look over there, you know, during days of unleavened bread, and you see this big uh, loaf of uh, maybe uh, freshly baked French bread, and smells good, but you look at it, and, and it's very obvious that it's leavened. It's leavened. All you got to do is look at it, you know. It's, it's, uh, uh, it's there, and, and you know it's leavened. But, you know, there are other things. You look on the shelf, and here are crackers, and... and uh, I know just the other day I was in the store and I was looking. I, I, uh, I knew that wheat thins were unleavened. So I got some, uh, I picked a package of wheat thins off the, uh, um, the shelf and I looked and there was, uh, um, there was another, it was, it was wheat thins too, same company, but it was, uh, I forget, a multi grain wheat thin or something like that. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that looks good. That, in fact, maybe that'll even be better because that's got, you know, seven, I think it was seven grains. And I thought, well, that's good. You know, that'll have maybe, uh, uh, be even more nutritious. It'll have all these other things in there. And I got that off and started putting it in. The, and, ju- and the thought struck me, you know, I really ought to read the label. And I, I, I almost debated with myself as to whether to read it. I thought, well, you know, it's wheat thins and it's made by the same company. And regular wheat thins aren't leavened, so I'm sure this wouldn't be either. It looks just like it, except they use some more grain. But then I read the label. And what did it say on there but leavening? Now, I don't know why they put leavening in one of them and don't put it in the other. If you'd have laid them out on a plate, I probably wouldn't have been able to tell the difference, except that one I could see, you know, had some extra things in it. But one of the extra things that it had in it wasn't obvious. That was the leavening. Christ warned his disciples to beware of the leavening of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Their leavening was their doctrine. Now, let's go back to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. In verse 14, we pick up Mark's account of the same thing. You know, the Bible is written here a little, there a little. You have to put the whole thing together in order to understand it. Mark eight fourteen. The disciples had forgotten to take bread. Neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. So they didn't have enough to eat. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. 
And they reasoned among themselves, saying, it's because we have no bread. And, of course, Jesus said, why are you reasoning about not having bread? Don't you understand? Is your heart hardened? Don't you know how I fed the 5,000 and fed the 4,000? And uh, he said, how is it that, in verse 21, that you don't understand? You don't get the point. Now, here, in Mark's account, we find that there's another leaven that is mentioned. See, Matthew and Mark both give part of the story. Matthew mentions that Christ warned them about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Sadducees. Mark mentions that he mentioned the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So obviously Christ mentioned all three. They each just give sort of part of the count. They, they, they each give a summary. Christ warned his disciples about the leaven of the Pharisees, the leaven of the Sadducees, and the leaven of Herod. Let's come on back to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. In verse 1, In the meantime, there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch they trod one upon another, and began to say, He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There's nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Oh. Now, what is hypocrisy? Hypocrite is actually a Greek word. We, we use it in English, but it, its origin is a Greek word, and, and the word is pronounced and spelled very similarly in Greek to our word hypocrite in English. And it was the Greek word for actor. Because a hypocrite was one who pretends to be something he's not. It was the word for actor. So here were people who play-acted their religion. But you know, Christ said, there's nothing covered that will not be revealed, hidden that will not be known. Sometimes, humanly, we get upset and we think somebody's getting by with something. Well, God says, that's not so. He says, there's nothing covered that will not be revealed. There's nothing hidden that will not be known. You know, God already knows. On the Greek stage, they wore masks. We see them sometimes, uh, particularly if you go to a drama presentation, maybe a high school or a college drama presentation, and they have the two little masks on the front the, representing comedy and tragedy, you know, the one with a smile, the one with a frown. Uh, in, in ancient Greece, when they, uh, uh, in, in the uh, Greek dramas, they literally wore masks uh, on the stage to represent the different characters and, and some of these masks uh, that are sort of stylized on, on the cover of, of uh, particularly uh, things pertaining to uh, the drama production and drama presentations in high school and, and colleges, uh, actually goes back to that. So when someone was out on the stage, you couldn't tell who it was because you couldn't see their face. They had on a mask, they had on a costume that was stylized to represent, uh, you know, the good guy or the bad guy or whoever it was. They appeared to be something they weren't. That's the way Christ said the Pharisees were with their religion. They were play-acting religion. Religion was something you put on. It was something you used to impress other people. He says there's nothing covered that won't be revealed. You know, God knows who's behind the mask. And time's going to come when God's going to take the mask off. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, neither hidden, that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you've spoken in darkness will be heard in the light, and what you've spoken in the ear in the closet shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Now, let's look a little bit at the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Herodians who were the followers of Herod. The word Pharisee means separated ones. It's uh, the Greek form of a Hebrew word that means separated ones. Back in the time between the Testaments, uh, as uh, the time after the Old Testament com was completed and prior to the beginning of the New Testament, 
one, the, the most important force that came through uh, that affected the people of God a little over 300 years before the time of Christ was what was called Hellenism, which just meant the influence of the Greek-speaking world. It started out with Alexander the Great, and even though he died, uh, his generals split up his empire. And the one thing that remained constant throughout the known world was Greek language, Greek culture, Greek philosophy. Uh, it, It was the Greek culture, the Greek approach to life. The spread of the Greek language gave a certain unity throughout the known world because even though it was a second language, most people, of course, spoke the language they grew up with, but then they learned Greek in order to be able to interact with others and and to take part in trade and commerce. Uh, It was the language of education. It was the language of culture. And just like all over the world today, American culture is exported. You can go all over the world and find that... uh, you know, American music and American blue jeans and American uh, Coca-Cola and American uh, McDonald's restaurants and all of these things. You, you can go uh, in, into Europe and, and Asia and Africa. Uh, you can go all over the world and you'll find the signs of American culture that particularly in the aftermath of World War II, everybody wanted to copy as much as what they could. And, of course, a lot of what they've copied has not been good. But it's had an effect. It's had an influence. That was the way it was uh, at the time of Alexander the Great. It was the Greek language. It was the Greek culture. That spread. And it affected and influenced the people of God. Because you see, the Greek language or the Greek culture was permeated with idolatry, It was permeated with all sorts of of philosophies and ideas and attitudes that are contrary to the Bible. And it it was a culture that very much affected the people, the Jews, living in Palestine. They were influenced. They were affected by it. Most of them wanted to copy it. They wanted to fit in. Because that's always been the tendency, you know from the beginning of the Bible all the way through, one of the ongoing battles of the people of God has been to fight against the tendency to fit in, to blend in with this world, this society. And most of the Jews went along with that. They, they adopted Greek names in place of their Hebrew names. They adopted Greek styles of dress. Uh, they adopted uh, the... Uh, uh, the Greek uh, athletic games and the immodesty that went with it of performing in the nude and all this sort of thing that that the Jews uh, prior to that time and and that uh, uh, ancient Israel would not have uh, have accepted. But uh, uh, all all these things that were very much a part of Greek culture and, of course, all of the idolatrous overtones and then the Greek philosophies and their attitudes, uh, this came in and it permeated Jewish culture Uh, Though, obviously, there have always been individuals who didn't go along with those sorts of things. Well, there was a reaction that took place. There was a group of people uh, in sort of a backlash, a pendulum swing, again, in reaction to uh, the the overt, uh, obvious Greek culture, who were the Pharisees, the separated ones. They had... The thing that characterized them was this attitude of separation, a holier-than-thou approach, because they looked upon everybody else as being sinners. But, you know, they actually brought a lot of, of, of the world with them, too. One of the things that Christ continually indicts them for was the fact that he indicts them for their hypocrisy and for the fact that they elevated their own tradition on a par and above the level of Scripture. Much of the tradition that, uh, onto which they held, the tradition of the elders, were not traditions that went back to the time of Moses. They were the traditions that went back a few generations that reflected uh, uh, Greek philosophical attitudes and concepts, Reflect, reflected practices and approaches that they had, because many of them developed an approach and an attitude of, of, 
of clever ways of sort of getting around the real force and intent of the law. And they could be very, very strict in little minor picky points, but they increasingly missed the overall impact. Jesus said in Matthew 23, verse 2, The scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, one, some translations render it that they sit themselves in Moses' seat. They'd put themselves in that spot, but God allowed it. Moses' seat was the seat of judgment. Now, it was not a matter, uh, let's just understand for a moment, it was not a matter that they were free to just uh, say anything they wanted to and people had to do it. Specifically, the... Uh, uh, in Jewish law, this referred to an assembly called the Great Beth Din, uh, the great uh, uh, the great synagogue, and it was the religious arm of the Sanhedrin. It made uh, religious decisions, uh, particularly dealing with the calendar and proclaiming of holy days. You know, everybody wasn't left to calculate the calendar for themselves. Uh, if we all we're left to calculate the calendar for ourselves. There's no telling how many different dates we'd come up with. And uh, so there was a unity in terms of the calendar. When was the new moon? When was uh, the 14th day of the month, the 15th day of the month, uh, in terms of the progression of the, of, of the cycle and uh, of the calendar? That was the primary function that the great synagogue served. There were other uh, smaller functions. The scribes and Pharisees <coughs> were in that capacity, and Christ didn't argue with, with that. They, they uh, uh, guarded that, and, and they did that. And he said, that's fine. And what they bid you to observe, that observe and do. But don't do after their works. Don't do it the way they do it. They say and do not. They bind, grievous, they bind heavy burdens, grievous to be born. All their works, verse 5, they do to be seen of men. They love, verse 6, the uppermost rooms at feasts. They don't have a serving, humble attitude. They're self-important. They're filled with uh, uh, an attitude of their own status. He said in verse 13, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, play actors. You shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. You don't go in yourselves, and you don't allow those that are entering to go in. You get people confused. Verse 14, you devour widow, widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. He said, coming on down, in verse 16, you blind guides which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing, but whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. You fools and blind, whether is greater, the gold or the, or the temple that sanctifies the gold? Verse 23, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay tithe of mint and annas and cumin, and have, omit, have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. You blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel... Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! You make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. You blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. <coughs> you see, the problem was not that they cleaned up the outside. The problem was they didn't clean up from the inside out. You know, it's not a problem that you have that your cup and saucer is clean on the outside. But it's even more important that it's clean on the inside. You know, if you had a pot and you always scrubbed it real good on the outside, but you made sure you never cleaned out the inside. Would you want to eat out of something like that? Now, it's fine to scrub the outside and cleanse that off. You know, particularly here, people that cooked over an open fire or something, and, you know, get smoky and dirty. That's great. You know, clean the outside. That's, that's good. But it's even more important to clean the inside. You see, they went, religion was an outward show. These were the kinds of individuals who would come to services 
And uh, they would have on their Sabbath best, and they would have on their Sabbath smile, and they would shake hands, and they would uh, pass out songbooks, and they would do all of the outward things, and go home and abuse their wives and children, and cheat on their taxes, and, and uh, you know, mistreat employees, and, and uh, uh, do all sorts of things. Be very scrupulous in their observance of the Sabbath. And yet, in realizing that our religion is not a a one-day-a-week religion, it's not a a two-hours-a-week religion, it's a a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week religion. It's a way of living and thinking and being. It's the way we treat our husband, our wife, our children. It's the way we treat one another. It's the way we work on the job. It's the way we conduct ourselves with our neighbors. It's the way we live. It's not something that our religion is not something we're to take on and hang up, uh, uh, take off and hang up when we go home from church. Uh, sort of like our Sabbath suit, get it out the next day, the next week, uh, put it back on, and we wear it back. You know, we wear our religion. That was the way the Pharisees were. Their religion was for outward show. They were the separated ones. They looked down on others. They were holier than thou. They were so strict and scrupulous in the outward things that people could see. And yet, on the inside, they were greedy and grasping and corrupt. Christ warned his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't let that leaven of mere outward show and religious formalism creep in and permeate the disciples of Christ. Our religion is not to be something we play act at. It is to be a transformation from the inside out that is to reflect the way we are, the way we think, the way we live. You know, spiritual leaven causes the the fermentation of a false life before people are even aware. It's a substitute for the real thing. He warned his disciples to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He warned them also to beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. You see, the Sadducees had also absorbed the Greek culture. They were the educated elite. They were the priestly class. Uh, In fact... uh, Just notice a couple of places in Acts chapter 5 and verse 17. We're told, Then the high priest arose, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the the Sadducees. (coughs) And they were filled with indignation. So the high priest and his friends were the sect of the Sadducees. That's who the Sadducees were. Now, there was a lot of rivalry between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Uh, The Sadducees claimed that they were... They rejected the oral tradition. You see, the Pharisees preserved a lot of the Greek pagan approach by claiming that it was the tradition of the fathers. And they superseded the Bible, the text of Scripture, with their own tradition. They misread the text by viewing it through the eyes of of worldly tradition. And religion was an outward show. And they made a big deal about how holy they were. Now the Sadducees, on the other hand, claimed that they rejected the worldly tradition. They rejected the tradition of the elders. They studied the text. But you see, the Sadducees were very much infected by Greek philosophy and by the pagan concepts of, uh, of, of the, uh, uh, of, because they were very highly educated, and the Greek uh, philosophical attitudes, the uh, skeptics, uh, the original skeptics were, were a school of thought among the Greeks. And we find here, for instance, in Acts chapter 23, let's just notice a little bit about the Sadducees, Acts uh, 23, verses uh, <clears throat> 
in uh, verse 8, Acts 23, 8, For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. <clears throat> so the Sadducees, while they claim to just stand by the Bible, they also read the Bible from a distorted standpoint. The Pharisees wanted to preserve the old folk customs and traditions that had grown up uh, in a semi-pagan uh, Jewish society uh, of the last several hundred years. And they wanted to, uh, to hold on to a lot of these customs and ideas and attitudes in the midst of a very uh, uh, holier-than-thou approach. The Sadducees, while they rejected a lot of these customs, the Sadducees looked down on others because they thought they were so smart. And they had their own problems. They rejected the <laughs> many principles of the Bible. They, they rejected the fact that there was a resurrection, or that there was a spirit realm. They took a very skeptical, very worldly approach. And, of course, you can read of different places where Christ uh, confronted them and dealt with them. They were the uh, they were really they were the intellectuals of the day and really filled with a lot of these attitudes and again <coughs> substituting in a matter of just sort of going <coughs> going through the form of religion uh, in John chapter two we read in verse thirteen about the Passover being at hand and Jesus going up to Jerusalem and he finds in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money and he drove the oxen and the sheep out and he threw over the tables of the money changers and he told those who were there in verse sixteen don't make my father's house a house of merchandise the Sadducees were responsible for this sort of thing a corrupting and a compromising of the true religion of God. The Pharisees and the Sadducees both had different ways of compromising with the world. The Sadducees were an intellectual compromise. Now, <clears throat> the final category that Christ mentioned was the Herodians, that his disciples need to be on guard against the, le the leaven of Herod. Now, we have the story of Herod, <clears throat> one account of Herod in Matthew 14, concerning Herod's dealings with John the Baptist. Herod was responsible for the murder of John the Baptist. We're told in Matthew 14, 3, that Herod had laid hold on John, bound him, put him in prison for Herodias' sake. Herodias was his brother Philip's wife. Now, why was Herodias mad at John the Baptist? Because John the Baptist had told Herod and Herodias they were living in adultery. John had said, it's not lawful for you to have her. John the Baptist was one who called sin, sin. And Herodias became very upset. Because John had publicly branded her for what she was. And she was incensed at being called what she was. You know, people like to be called what they aren't. And uh, she didn't want to be called what she was. <clears throat> and she was very upset. And uh, Herod was going arrested John. He would have put him to death. He was afraid of the multitude. Uh, then we're told in Matthew 14, verse 6, Herod's birthday was kept. And uh, the daughter of Herodias, uh, Salome, danced before them. And she pleased Herod. Now, this is not a little seven-year-old girl doing a tap dance. Uh, you, you know, it was uh, uh, not exactly the uh, uh, not not exactly that situation. Here, here they were having this big banquet, and they were all boozing it up. And she was perhaps, uh, uh, you know, a teenager, uh, far enough along that uh, uh, her uh, seductive dance of the seven veils uh, was. Uh, Enough that Herod was in such a state by the time she finished that he was promising her anything. 
uh, and, uh, you know, whatever she wanted. Uh, and uh, so she had already talked to her mother and was told to ask for the head of John the Baptist. The king sort of regretted having put himself in that spot, but he went ahead and went through with it. Now, Herod was, of course, a friend of the Romans. He had been put in his position by the Romans. And Herod and his followers were after money and power in a very open, blatant way. They didn't let the niceties of religion stand in their way of doing what they wanted. Because they were after status. Oh, they had the outward form of religion too. Uh, Herod attended the holy days and, and things of this sort. But what he did behind closed doors was a totally different matter. He had a very worldly, carnal lifestyle. He was after real power and real money and real wealth, real control. Christ warned his disciples about allowing these sorts of leaven to creep in. Well, Jesus defined himself as the bread of life. He said in John chapter 6, verse 33, The bread of God is he which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He said in verse 35, I am the bread of life. He says in verse 38, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Jesus Christ said in verse 48, I am the bread of life. In verse 50, this is the bread which comes down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus Christ told us that we are to partake of him. We are to take in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is to live his life in us. Jesus Christ who came, as we're told in the book of Philippians, who emptied himself, came as, as a servant. He came willing to serve and to die for us. We are to have that sort of an attitude. To have the mind of Christ. Jesus Christ did nothing through strife or vainglory, but he humbled himself and gave himself. He epitomized sincerity and truth, the unleavened bread of life. As we conclude the days of unleavened bread, it's not enough just to make sure our homes are unleavened. We have to examine our lives that our lives are unleavened. Un unleavening our lives, getting rid of the malice and the wickedness, getting rid of the kinds of religious leaven that Christ warned his disciples of. The leaven of the Pharisees the leaven of the Sadducees, the leaven of Herod. Replacing all of that with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus Christ, the bread of life, taking in Jesus Christ, allowing Him to live His life in us through the power of the Spirit of God, that we go forward to keep the feast. Certainly not with the old leaven, neither with the unleaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but to keep it with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, to keep it with Jesus Christ, the unleavened bread of life.